This is an illustration of the solar system. It is not to scale. You have the Sun plus eight planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Sorry for you Pluto fans, but Pluto's been downgraded to a dwarf planet, but those are included on the list too. This is an illustration of the Sun and the planets to scale, of size, but not of, of distance. The Earth is this little dot right here, by the way. There are two widely held models of the origin of the solar system. The evolutionary view that the solar system formed from a cloud of dust and gas by itself four and a half billion years ago, and the view that the solar system was created by God about 6,000 years ago. The question before us is which model does the better job of explaining the origin of the solar system? Both models make different predictions about what we should find, so let us look at the facts and see which model fits the data best. According to the number hypothesis, the solar system condensed out of a swirling cloud of dust and gas. The sun is thought to have formed by the center of the cloud collapsing, while planets, dwarf planets, moons, and other bodies are thought to have formed has dust and gas orbiting around the forming star collected into larger and larger clumps. However, the picture generally depicted of planets building up this way does not fit observation or what science says will happen in such clouds. All of the planets and moons should orbit in the same direction as the sun rotates. Also, all the planets and moons should rotate in the same west-east direction as the sun rotates. Dwarf planets and their moons should fit the same pattern since the category was not invented until the 1990s and the first two dwarf planets discovered, Pluto and Ceres, were originally called planets. Rocky planets should be found near the sun. Gas giants should be found further out. No prediction of small icy planets, dwarf planets, still further out. According to the creation model, God created the solar system on day four of the creation week of Genesis chapter one. This event should have happened about 6,000 years ago. The flood on earth, Genesis six through eight, may have had components that produced effects in the space within the solar system. Creation predictions. The solar system should show some degree of order and patterns. There should be evidence on planets, including dwarf planets, consistent with the solar system being thousands of years old and not billions. We should expect to find evidence that goes against naturalistic models of the solar system's origins. There are problems with the nebula hypothesis. Let's look at the dynamics of a cloud in space. One problem with a solar system mass cloud spread throughout the volume of the solar system is that gravity would be too weak to cause collapse. A particle deep inside the cloud would bounce around hitting other particles. However, a particle near the edge of the cloud would bounce around hitting other particles until it is bounced to the edge of the cloud and escapes from the cloud. Over time, the cloud would expand and get thinner, and in time, it would dissipate completely. This is a result of the internal pressure of the gas within the cloud. Gravity in any such cloud is simply too weak to cause the cloud to collapse. To cause a collapse, you need a central dense spot to increase the gravitational pull within the cloud. Or, the cloud itself has to be dense enough for its gravity to overcome the pressure of the gas within the cloud. The problem is that by itself, a cloud of dust and gas in space will not produce the conditions for collapse. Without either a central mass or sufficient density to overcome gas pressure, the nebula hypothesis is a non-starter. Two proposed ways to get the needed compression of gas clouds are forces from a supernova or galactic collision. Since a supernova is an exploding star and galaxies are large groups of stars, you still cannot get the first stars. Another problem is that while dust can clump together to form larger clumps and possibly even small pebbles, they can't grow any bigger than that. Once the clumps reach pebble size, the impact of these pebbles are fast enough to break the pebbles up. You need to get to a kilometer or more size asteroid before there is enough gravity to grow any bigger. Thus, there is no way of going from small pebbles to kilometer size asteroids and so no way to get planets. 
Even if you somehow got kilometer-sized asteroids, they would not last long enough to form planets. These kilometer-plus-sized asteroids would experience drag from the surrounding gas, causing them to slow down and spiral into the sun. Thus, there is no way to get planets from this process since the same environment that formed the asteroids would quickly destroy them. One of the big problems with this model is that the sun rotates too slowly. The sun contains 99.9% .9 of the mass of the solar system, but the planets contain 98% of the angular momentum. This means that the planets have 50 times the sun's angular momentum, while the sun would need to have 700 times the planet's combined angular momentum. The proposed solution is that the sun has slowed over time, but this fails to consider the true scope of the problem. Just to get the sun even with the planets, it would have to be rotating 50 times faster than it is. But to satisfy conservation momentum, it would have to have started rotating 700 times faster than that. This means that the sun's initial rotation was 35,000 times its present rate. Now the sun presently rotates at one revolution per 23.38 Earth days. So a rotation rate 35,000 times faster produces an initial revolution of 1 minute and 2.65 seconds. According to the CRC Handbook of Chemistry and Physics, the sun's equatorial rotational velocity is 2.0578 kilometers per second. This means that the initial equatorial rotational velocity would be 72,023 kilometers per second, or nearly a quarter of the speed of light. The sun's surface escape velocity is 6 117.23 kilometers per second, which is 116.7 times smaller than the initial equatorial rotational velocity of 72,023 kilometers per second. The result is that the sun would literally fly apart, assuming it formed to begin with, which of course it would not have. One proposed solution to this problem is that the sun somehow transferred some of its angular momentum to the planets as they were forming. This is alleged to have resulted from the presence of a magnetic field or turbulence in the planetary nebula. And exactly how it is supposed to have happened is rather vague. However, the transfer of angular momentum would have to be rather fast, or the dust and gas would fall into the star within years. The International Astronomical Union defined a planet has an object that orbits the sun, has sufficient mass to be round or nearly round, is not a satellite that is a moon of another object, and has removed debris and small objects from the area around its orbit. The fourth qualification assumes the nebula hypothesis. A more objective way to put it is removes debris and small objects from the area around its orbit, or is gravitationally dominant in its area so that there are no other bodies of comparable size other than its satellites. There are eight bodies in the solar system that meet these criteria. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Sorry Pluto fans, Pluto has other similar size objects around it, so it lacks gravitational dominance. Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, with an average distance of 35,928,800 880 miles. It orbits the Sun every 88 Earth days with a rotational period of 58.65 Earth days west to east, with days equal to 175.942 Earth days. Mercury has an equatorial radius of 1,516 miles and an orbital inclination of 7 degrees, which is greater than that of any other planet. Its orbital eccentricity is 0.206, which is also greater than any other The mean density of Mercury is 5.43 grams per cubic centimeter. This is so dense that it is thought to have a large iron core comprising over 40% of its volume. Mercury is way denser than evolutionary models say it should be. The explanation given is that a large impact stripped away the lighter material into space. However, there is no evidence of this impact. It is simply needed to make the evolutionary models fit reality. Mercury also has a magnetic field, despite the fact that any original magnetic field should have disappeared long ago if Mercury were billions of years old. 
The only way for a planet to maintain a magnetic field for billions of years is a planetary dynamo inside a molten core. Mercury is too small to maintain a molten core for billions of years. The explanation given is that Mercury's core has been kept liquid by sulfur mixed with the iron core. However, evolutionary models don't allow sulfur to condense so close to the sun, making yet another problem for these models. Even worse for evolutionary models, the messenger space probe showed that Mercury's magnetic field strength has fallen since Mariner 10 in 1974. Not only is this decay too fast for Mercury to have maintained a magnetic field for billions of years, it fits the prediction of a young Earth creation model of planetary magnetic fields. So, Mercury is too dense to have formed from a planetary nebula. It has a magnetic field that it cannot have if it is billions of years old. Efforts to fix this problem only cause more problems for a planetary nebula formation of Mercury. And the decay of Mercury's magnetic field fits a young Earth model predictions. Venus is the second planet from the Sun, with an average distance of 67,234,935 miles. It has a year of 224.7 Earth days, and a rotational period of 243.01 Earth days. And it rotates east to west. A day on Venus lasts 117 Earth days. It has an equatorial radius of 3,760 miles, an orbital inclination of 3.39 degrees, an orbital eccentricity of 0 0.007. Venus has a thick, largely carbon dioxide atmosphere, which causes a runaway greenhouse effect, making it the hottest planet in the solar system, with an average temperature of almost 900 degrees. Its surface pressure is about 90 atmospheres, which is the same as being 3,000 feet deep in Earth's oceans. Venus is about the same size as Earth, with about the same chemical makeup. Since they are in about the same place in the solar system, according to evolutionary models, they should be a lot alike, but they could not be more different. Some of the ways in which Venus is different from Earth is that when it rains on Venus, it rains sulfuric acid. Venus has no tectonic plates and no magnetic field. If both planets formed at the same time from the same material in about the same place, why are they so different? Furthermore, the Earth has a relatively large moon, while Venus has no moon at all. Now, the evolutionary theory to explain this is that Venus once had a moon, but that it was destroyed by a giant impact. However, there is no evidence for such a moon or its destruction. It's just another necessity to make evolutionary models fit reality. Venus's surface is quite young because its surface is so fresh. There is no indication of large amounts of erosion or chemical weathering, despite a highly acidic atmosphere. Evolutionists speculate that the entire planet was resurfaced by some unknown means for some unknown reason. They date this event to 500 million years ago, based on crater count. However, such dates require assuming that the current crater rate has been unchanged for 500 million years. And there's evidence elsewhere in the solar system that this assumption is wrong. According to evolutionary models, Venus and Earth should be quite similar, yet they are very different. Venus's surface is young and fresh, and it rotates east to west, which goes against it forming from a planetary nebula. Venus is consistent with a solar system that is just a few thousand years old, and it is not consistent with a solar system that is billions of years old. The Earth is the third planet from the Sun, at an average distance of 92,955,807 miles. Its year is 365.25 days. It has a rotational period of 23 hours, 55 minutes, and 41 seconds, west to east, and its daylight cycle is 24 hours. The Earth has an equatorial radius of 3,959 miles. It has an orbital inclination of 0 degrees with, with an eccentricity of 0 0.017. The, the Earth is unique in one very important way, and that is that it is our home. According to evolutionists, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, but there is abundant evidence that the Earth is much younger. The 4.5 billion year evolutionary age of the Earth 
is based on a lead 206, lead 204 isochron with meteors. It was published in a paper called Age of Meteorites in the Earth by Claire Patterson in 1956. The date assumes that the Earth formed from a planetary nebula. However, he also indicates that if the Earth formed a different way, it could be any age younger than 4.5 billion years, which would include 6,000 years. For now, we are going to grant evolutionists the age of the Earth, since it causes other problems for their models of how the solar system formed. We are only going to look at these problems here, and not at the age of the Earth. The Earth has a powerful magnetic field that protects us from solar radiation. Evolutionary theories propose a dynamo in the Earth's liquid core. This theory remains highly speculative and has problems, one of which is getting it started in the first place. One of which is the fact that the Earth's magnetic field decays. It loses about half of its energy every 1400 years. The usual response is that the Earth's magnetic field is simply reversing, which it has done in the past. However, this is not about field strength on the Earth, but total field energy, and that energy is fading quite quickly. Projecting back, the total field energy would double every 1400 years, getting impossibly strong about 20,000 years ago. None of this is explained by a planetary dynamo, which would need to maintain that energy for billions of years. The Earth is unique in other ways. The Earth is just right for life. The magnetic field protects us from solar radiation. The atmosphere is just right for life. A thicker or different composition would create a runaway greenhouse effect. And if the atmosphere were thinner, the Earth would freeze. The rotation rate is just right. A faster rotation would produce violent winds. And a slower rotation would produce extreme temperature changes. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. If the Earth's surface were smoothed out, the water would flood the Earth to a depth of one and a half miles. So the Earth has more than enough water for a global flood. The presence of water on the Earth goes against a planetary nebula. This is because water cannot condense this close to the Sun. So the Earth would have had to form without water. So where did the water come from? Evolutionists used to claim that the Earth's water came from comets. But comet ice is chemically different from the Earth's oceans, including the fact that it has higher levels of deuterium. The result is that Earth's oceans could not have come from comets, and the Earth should be dry. All this means that Earth defies being formed from a planetary nebula. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun with an average distance of 141,971,400 4 miles. Its year is 687 Earth days. Its rotational period is 24 hours, 37 minutes, and 26 seconds, west to east, with a day of 24 hours, 39 minutes, and 35 seconds. Mars has an equatorial radius of 2,106 miles, an orbital inclination of 1.86 degrees, and an orbital eccentricity of 0 0.093. While Mars is smaller than Earth, it has both the largest volcanoes and largest canyon in the solar system. It has many features that are carved by water, but today Mars is dry. It has frozen water, but it has an atmosphere that is too thin for liquid water today. Evolutions are desperate to find life on a planet other than Earth, as if that would prove life can come from non-life. However, twice impossible is still impossible. Besides, even if life were found on Mars, it could have easily have arrived there from Earth by several means. To make life possible on Mars in the past, evolutionists need a lot of water on Mars for a long time. They need a long history of water on Mars for life to have evolved there. So they speculate that Mars once had a thicker atmosphere that allowed liquid water and that the solar wind gradually stripped it away. The irony is that in this case there is evidence of a large impact in the form of the Hellas Impact Basin. At 1,300 miles in diameter and 5.6 miles deep, it is the largest impact crater on Mars. The energy of the impact was 5.33 times 10 to the 26 joules. This is a blast of 1.27 times 10 to the 11 megatons. This is the equivalent to about 
eight and a half trillion atomic bombs like the one dropped on Hiroshima. The bad news for evolutionists is that Hellas is on the opposite side of Mars from the Tharsis volcanoes. Directly opposite the center of Hellas is the western side of Alba Pretura's caldera. Alba Pretura is the largest Martian volcano by surface area. This shows a cause and effect relationship between Hellas and the Tharsis volcanoes. But based on cratering, evolutionists date them as millions of years apart. This shows that dating surfaces by craters is not accurate. The evidence for a cause and effect relationship between Hellas and the Tharsis volcanoes is too strong. This is because the odds of this alignment happening by chance is too small for there to be no connection in millions of years between them. Furthermore, the evidence shows that the water that once flowed on Mars was concentrated sulfuric acid. This would be consistent with heavy volcanic activity and it would also have been deadly to life. Jupiter is the largest planet in the solar system and the fifth planet from the Sun with an average distance of 483,630,473 miles. It is also the first of the gas giants. Its year is 11.862 Earth years and its rotational period is 9 hours, 50 minutes, and 26 seconds west to east. Its day is 9 hours, 55 minutes, and 30 seconds. Jupiter's equatorial radius is 43,441 miles. Its orbital inclination is 1.31 degrees, and its orbital eccentricity is 0 0.048. Jupiter is covered with large bands of clouds with large electrical storms. Its most famous feature is the Great Red Spot, a huge storm larger than the Earth that has been raging for as long as we have had telescopes to look at it. This makes it at least several hundred years old. Spinning at just under 10 hours, Jupiter is not only the fastest rotating planet in the solar system, but it is faster than evolutionary models say it should be. If Jupiter condensed out of a swirling cloud of gas and dust, it should be spinning about once a week. And the energy needed to spin it up as fast as it is, is just too great. Evolutionary models also predicted that Jupiter would lack certain elements, including argon, krypton, xenon, and nitrogen. However, our probes have shown that it has plenty of these elements. Evolutionary models require Jupiter to have a large core that is at least 10 times the mass of the Earth. Such a core would have been needed to form Jupiter from a nebula to provide a gravitational center for the gas and dust. However, the Galileo probe found that the core is at most three times the mass of the Earth and probably even smaller, that is, if it exists at all. Estimates show that Jupiter would have taken 10 to 100 million years to form from a nebula. However, evolutionary models show the dust and gas needed would have lasted only 5 million years. So according to evolutionary models, Jupiter would not have had time to form, so it should not even exist. Saturn is the sixth planet from the Sun, with an average distance of 886,686,852 miles. Its year is 29.458 Earth years, and its rotational period is 10 hours, 13 minutes, and 26 seconds, west to east. So its days last 10 hours and 30 minutes. Saturn has an equatorial radius of 37 1,449 miles. Its orbital inclination is 2.49 degrees and its orbital eccentricity is 0 0.056. Saturn's rings are the most recognized planetary feature in all of astronomy. They make Saturn the most easily recognized planet in the solar system. Now despite their solid appearance, they are composed of small particles of ice and dust orbiting together ranging from dust to boulders. They are extremely thin compared to their diameter. In fact, they literally disappear when seen on edge. Saturn's rings have some strange features. 
They include spokes across the rings discovered by Voyager in 1980. Furthermore, Cassini has shown that they were still there in 2014. Some rings are even braided. No one expected to see these types of features in the rings, and some of them are still puzzling. No one really knows how Saturn's rings were formed. There is some speculation of an asteroid shattering a moon or being torn to pieces by Saturn's gravity, but there is no evidence of this. According to NASA, their age and origin are unknown. Saturn defies evolutionary models in other ways. It has a magnetic field that is too symmetrical around its axis for the dynamo model. It does, however, fit a young Earth model of planetary magnetic fields in strength and structure. Also, calculations show that the interaction between the cores and gaseous nebula would cause Saturn and Jupiter's cores to spiral into the Sun before the planets could fully form. So according to the nebula model, Saturn and Jupiter should not exist, since they should have fallen into the Sun billions of years ago. This is called the migration problem, and there is as yet no solution. Since Saturn and Jupiter clearly exist, their very existence falsifies the nebula model. Uranus is the seventh planet from the Sun, with an average distance of 1,783,952,074 miles. Its year is 84 Earth years, and it has a rotational period of 17 hours, 54 minutes, and 14 seconds, east to west. The inclination of its equator to its orbit is 97.9 degrees. That is, it is literally rotating on its side. Its equatorial radius is 15,517 miles. Its orbital inclination is 0 0.77 degrees. Its orbital eccentricity is 0 0.046. Voyager 2 is the only probe to have visited Uranus, and it poses several problems for evolutionary models. The first of which is that it spins east to west. And unlike Venus, this is not a slow rotation, but a fairly fast one, being just short of 18 hours despite evolutionary models requiring it to be west to east. Shown here is a false color image of Uranus's south pole. The fact is Uranus literally orbits the sun on its side with a rotational tilt of 97.9 .9 degrees. This is way more than evolutionary models can produce, so it's alleged to have been tilted by a collision with an Earth-sized asteroid, for which there is no evidence. There are other problems with this hypothetical collision, including Uranus's stability as it rolls through space. Its orbit is nearly circular, and its orbital inclination is less than any planet other than Earth. Uranus also has 24 moons, and a faint ring, all of which orbit at the equator. It has been proposed that Uranus simply wobbled into this tilt, dragging its moons with it by tidal drag. But this degree of tilt is beyond any reasonable wobbling, particularly given Uranus's reverse spin. The other gas giants radiate more heat into space than they get from the Sun, but Uranus doesn't. Uranus also has a magnetic field, despite the fact that evolutionary models predicted that it would have little or no magnetic field. However, the Young Earth creation model, developed by Dr. Humphreys, predicted Uranus would have a magnetic field and at the right strength. Also, Uranus's magnetic field is tilted about 60 degrees with respect to the rotational axis, so that the magnetic poles are near the equator. The source of Uranus's field is also offset from the center by about a third of a planetary radius. According to the dynamo theory, the magnetic poles and rotational axes should nearly always be closely aligned, except for a relatively short time during a field reversal. But Uranus's field does not seem to be reversing because it is not alone in this trait. Neptune is the eighth planet from the Sun, with an average distance of 2,794,352,810 miles. Its year is 164.78 Earth years, and its rotational period is 17 hours, 13 minutes, and 35 seconds west to east.
Its equatorial radius is 15,299 miles. Its orbital inclination is 1.77 degrees. Its orbital eccentricity is 0 0.01. Neptune is warmer than evolutionary models say it should be because it radiates twice as much heat as it gets from the sun. It is more active than evolutionary models say it should be with the fastest wind speeds in the solar system. And it has a dark spot about the size of the Earth discovered by Voyager 2 in 1989. This one disappeared before 1994, and a new one was discovered in 1995 in a different location. It is clearly an active change in place. It is neither cold nor dead, as evolutionists expected. Neptune's magnetic field is also a problem for evolutionists. Like Uranus, Neptune's magnetic field is tilted about 60 degrees with respect to its rotational axis, with magnetic poles near the equator. And the source of Neptune's field is offset from the center by about one-third of a planetary radius. According to the dynamo theory, magnetic and rotational axes should nearly always be closely aligned. This falsifies the idea that Uranus's field was in the process of reversing because the odds of two planets reversing their magnetic field at the same time is way too small. The Young Earth Creation Model Planetary Magnetic Fields, developed by Dr. Humphreys, also predicted Neptune would have a magnetic field and at the right strength. This problem has been known for some time, having been discovered in 1972. Despite the fact that according to evolutionary models, Uranus and Neptune should not exist, evolutionists keep talking as though the nebula model is proven fact. Uranus and Neptune are not a problem for creationists, but evolutionists are stuck with a theory that does not work because God is excluded as a starting assumption. The International Astronomical Union defined a dwarf planet as an object that orbits the sun, has sufficient mass to be round or nearly round, is not a satellite that is a moon of another object, and has not removed debris and small objects from the area around its orbit. The fourth qualification assumes the nebula hypothesis. A more objective way to put it would be, does not remove debris or small objects from the area around its orbit. Or, it is not gravitationally dominant in its area, so that there are other bodies of comparable size other than its satellites. Ceres is the closest dwarf planet to the Sun, at an average distance of 257,112,044 miles. Its year is 4.6 Earth years. Its rotational period is 9 hours, 4 minutes, and 19 seconds west to east, with a day of 9 hours, 4 minutes, and 37 seconds. Its equatorial radius is 304 miles. Its orbital inclination is 10.6 degrees. And its orbital eccentricity is 0 0.07976. Like Pluto, Ceres has had a classification problem. When it was first discovered, Ceres was classified as a planet. After the discovery of smaller bodies in the same area, it was downgraded to an asteroid. However, it was recently upgraded to the new classification of dwarf planet. This is the Hana Mons, a three-mile-high ice volcano and the highest mountain on Ceres. It is erupting a salty, icy slush, producing a mountain with steep slopes. This was a surprise on a dwarf planet that should have completely solidified. Ceres also defies evolutionary models by its crater count. Evolutionists predicted 10 to 15 craters more than 250 miles across, and at least 40 craters more than 62 miles across. They found only 16 craters more than 62 miles across, and no craters greater than 175 miles across. Ceres shows evidence of being young. This is inconsistent with a solar system that formed from a nebula billions of years ago. It is, however, consistent with a solar system that was created just a few thousand years ago. Pluto was the first of the outer dwarf planets to be discovered, and the closest of them to the Sun at an average distance of 3,674,487,277 miles. Its year is 248.54 Earth years. And its rotational period is 
1.4 Earth days rotating east to west. It was originally classified as a planet, but downgraded to a dwarf planet after the discovery of Eris, which is in the same area and a little larger. Pluto's equatorial radius is 737.6 miles. Its orbital inclination is 17.15 degrees, and its orbital eccentricity is 0 0.248. One of the problems Pluto poses for evolutionary models is the fact that it rotates backwards, as does Venus and Uranus. Having one such body is bad enough, but three should falsify these models. Also, Pluto has been shown to be emitting X-rays that result from interactions between the solar wind and a planetary magnetic field. Pluto also deflects the solar wind in a manner that suggests that it has a magnetosphere. Unfortunately, the chance to see directly if Pluto does have a planetary magnetic field was lost because of weight and the fact that their models predicted that it would not have a magnetic field. New Horizons does not have a magnetometer on board. The fact is that there is evidence that Pluto does have a magnetic field. This is yet another problem for evolutionary models that the creation planetary magnetic field model has no problem with and actually predicted. The most notable feature of Pluto is a large impact crater that exposed lighter material under a darker surface material. The lighter material is probably ice that melted during the impact and refroze as it filled the crater. The other thing to note is that despite this large crater, Pluto's surface seems to have relatively few craters. This means that surface is younger than most of the cratering in the solar system, suggesting present geological activity. Geological activity on such a small, cold world is more consistent with a young Pluto that is thousands of years old rather than billions. This high-resolution picture shows water ice mountains. Their presence in the absence of craters show ongoing geological activity. The presence of these water ice mountains would suggest that Pluto is warm enough inside to have liquid water that freezes at the surface. If this is the case, the presence of these mountains is consistent with a young Pluto rather than an older one. Most of this image shows craterless ice with nitrogen ice flows coming out of the cracks in the ice. This shows further evidence of current geological activity as well as a liquid subsurface. We do, however, find the first evidence of craters in a close-up image, and yet there are only seven craters in a small part of the rough terrain visible in this image, suggesting that even this area is still rather young. This image shows a dark area with significant cratering. However, the rest of the image shows a clear lack of craters, but numerous mountains surrounded by thin ice sheets, some of which show cracks and evidence of underlying liquid material. The lack of craters among the mountains show their recent features. The evidence for recent geological activity on Pluto is overwhelming, given the fact that the four and a half billion year model predicts that Pluto should be geologically dead, while a recent creation with periods of accelerated nuclear decay 48,000 years ago predicts recent geological activity on Pluto. This means that Pluto is providing excellent support for the biblical creation model. Moons are planetary bodies that orbit other planetary bodies, and many of the moons in the solar system cause problems for evolutionary models. This is no surprise from a creationist perspective, since evolutionary models assume the solar system formed by purely natural causes, and according to creationists, moons and planets did not form as evolutionists assumed they did. The moon is the Earth's only permanent natural satellite, with an average distance from the Earth of 239,000 miles. It has an orbital period of 27 days, 7 hours, 33 minutes, and 11.6 seconds, with rotational period of 27 days, 7 hours, 40 minutes, and 48 seconds, west to east. The moon is the only other planetary body mankind has visited. Its equatorial radius is 1,079 miles. 
Its orbital inclination is 30.35 degrees, and its orbital eccentricity is 0 0.549. The moon presents many problems for evolutionary models, the main one of which is its existence. There are several failed theories of its formation, proven wrong by the Apollo missions to the moon. The moon has numerous ghost craters, which are craters filled in by lava. The lava flows resulted from lava coming to the surface after a large impact. The problem for evolutionary models of cratering is that the large impact would obliterate any existing craters. This means that the ghost crater impacts had to occur after the large impact, but before the lava flowed. This could not have taken millions of years. At most, it would have been hours or days. This shows the cratering to be far more rapid than evolutionary models predict, thus showing that these surfaces are thousands of years old at most. The moon is slowly moving away from the Earth and slowing the Earth's rotation in the process. This was first discovered following the Apollo moon landings by bouncing lasers off reflectors left behind by the astronauts. The reflectors were designed to accurately measure the Earth-Moon distance. The measurements showed that the Moon is getting further away at a rate of 1.5 inches or 3.82 centimeters per year. Furthermore, a day is getting longer by 1.7 milliseconds per century. Both effects are a result of tidal forces between the Earth and the Moon, and these are the same forces that are responsible for the high and low tides experienced every day. Plugging the current data into the laws of physics, the result is that the moon would have been at the Earth's roach limit of 15,562 kilometers, 1.171 billion years ago. The roach limit is the closest distance a body like the moon can be to the Earth without being torn apart by gravity. This is far short of the four and a half billion years given for the age of the Earth and the Moon, suggesting the Earth-Moon system cannot be four and a half billion years old. The giant collision hypothesis of the Moon proposes that the Moon formed as a result of a collision between the Earth and a Mars-sized body referred to as Thea. This is the latest in a long line of theories, and it will probably be taught in schools as fact, only to be replaced in a few decades by a new theory that will be taught as fact. One of the problems with it is that the impact needs to be at just the right angle to work. There is a greater chance of destroying both planets completely than producing the moon. The question before us is can you get the current Earth-Moon system from this process in a manner consistent with the observed data? What follows is an analysis of the receding of the moon and slowing of the Earth's rotation to test the feasibility of this model with regards to the laws of celestial mechanics. This model has a set of starting conditions for the Earth-Moon system resulting from the hypothetical impact. The model has a five-hour day on Earth when the moon formed. It further starts with the moon at just 14,000 miles or 22,526 kilometers from Earth. These starting conditions allow us to calculate the model forward to the present to see how it fits reality. The result was a present lunar distance of 440,476 kilometers, which is larger than the current value. It also results in a present Earth day of 44.9 hours, which is nearly twice the current value. There have occasionally been observed flashes on the moon called transient lunar phenomenon, they suggest some form of outgassing occasionally occurs on the moon. 579 such observations have been cataloged by NASA. Apollo 15 even detected radon gas coming from Arcturus crater. Apparently, the moon is still geologically active. This makes perfect sense if the moon is only a few thousand years old, but not if it is billions of years old. One evolutionist illustrated the difficulty they have in explaining the moon by purely natural means by jokingly saying that the best explanation for the moon is observational error. Jupiter has over 60 moons, and they also pose problems for evolutionary models of the solar system. We will look at the four largest. Io has a radius of 1,131 
2.7 miles, making it larger than Earth's moon. It orbits Jupiter at 262,088 miles, with an orbital period of 42 hours. Io is the most volcanic place in the solar system. Over 400 volcanoes have been found, with at least 150 of them still active. One called Loki is more powerful than all of Earth's volcanoes combined. These volcanoes are so powerful that they have been observed ejecting material as high as 250 miles into space. Lava geysers have been measured, shooting material out at over 2,000 miles an hour. This is 10 times faster than the fastest seen on Earth. Io puts out twice as much heat as the Earth. Some of it comes from tidal flexing between Jupiter and the other three large moons. However, tidal flexing can only produce some of this heat. If Io really were billions of years old, this heat would have dissipated long ago. It is, however, not a problem if Io is only thousands of years old. According to evolutionary models, Io should not have all these volcanoes, but it does. Another problem is the amount of lava being spewed from Io. One volcano alone floods the surface with 100 cubic meters of lava per second. The amount of material being erupted on Io is so large that if Io really were billions of years old, it would have recycled itself 30 times. Europa has a radius of 950 miles, making it smaller than Earth's moon. It orbits Jupiter at 414,000 miles, with an orbital period of 85 hours. Europa is the smoothest object in the solar system. One of its most noticeable features is its lack of craters. Because it is covered with a shell of ice, it is almost completely smooth. This ice is several miles thick and thought to have an ocean of liquid water underneath. And in the evolutionary mindset, where there is water, there is life. So evolutionists are very interested in Europa. In fact, evolutionists are so desperate to find life off of Earth that just finding evidence of liquid water starts to claim to possible life, even without evidence for life. The idea is that finding life elsewhere would prove that life got started all on its own. Never mind the fact that life, if found on Europa, could have come from Earth. Never mind the fact that if God created life on Earth, he could have put some microbes on Europa. Because Europa has so few craters, they can be studied easily, and the results go against evolutionary models of cratering. This study showed that one impact can throw up debris, forming even more craters of all sizes. This effect was already known, but the study showed that 95% of small craters and many medium-sized craters were formed in this way. This shows that planets and moons were hit by fewer impacts than previously thought. This calls into question the dating of surfaces by the number of craters. Ganymede is Jupiter's largest moon with a radius of 1,635 miles, making it larger than Earth's moon and the planet Mercury. Ganymede is also the largest moon in the solar system. It orbits Jupiter at 665,000 miles, with an orbital period of 172 hours. Evolutionary models predicted that Ganymede would not have a magnetic field. This is because it is too small and cold for a planetary dynamo. However, Ganymede does have a magnetic field. Evolutionists are forced by the strength of the magnetic field to assume that Ganymede has a dynamo. This is despite the fact that Ganymede could not have maintained a liquid core forced such a dynamo to last billions of years. On the other hand, creationist models and time scales do allow for the presence of a decaying magnetic field, even in a solid core. As a result, Ganymede is a problem for evolutionary models, but it fits well with creation models. Ganymede's terrain is very unusual as well. There are rocky areas, grooved areas, and relatively smooth areas. Some of this flat terrain goes right across grooved and rocky terrain with paintbrush-like streaks. Furthermore, some of these areas have few, if any, craters. In fact, some of the grooved areas have smooth, crater-free material inside the grooves. All of this suggests that Ganymede is still geologically active, and thus much younger than evolutionary models claim. Callisto was Jupiter's second largest moon with a radius of 1,498 miles, making it larger than Earth's moon, but smaller than Mercury. 
it orbits Jupiter at 1,169,856 miles with an orbital period of 400 hours and it is the farthest out of the Galilean moons. Callisto is the most heavily cratered object in the solar system. As a result, evolution see its surface is very old, about 4 billion years. But does it fit the evolutionary cratering model? Furthermore, some pictures show evidence of fresh ice on the surface of Callisto. This means that there is still erosion and geological activity on Callisto, which should not be the case if it really were 4.5 billion years old. It should be cold and dead, but it isn't. Saturn has dozens of moons of various sizes. Several of them are quite interesting. Let's take a look at them. Celebus has a radius of 157 miles. It orbits Saturn at 147,918 miles with an orbital period of 33 hours. The big surprise for Enceladus is the huge geyser at its south pole. This is a problem for evolutionary models, since if it were billions of years old, it would have cooled and frozen solid long ago. Yet, it is spewing water into space and actually painting its neighbors with ice and snow. One theory is a combination of tidal and radiogenic heating. While tidal heating could produce heat for 4.5 billion years, it does not produce enough to explain the huge geyser. Radiogenic heating could produce enough heat, but radiogenic heating decreases with time as the radioisotopes decay. A cell dust would have needed a lot of radioactive material to start with to still have enough to keep heating Enceladus today. Furthermore, the geyser material would have to come from an ocean under its icy crust. Even with the presence of enough heat melting crustal ice, the ice would still thin over time. How much ice would Enceladus need to start with to keep erupting for 4.5 billion years? Saturn's largest moon has a radius of 1,600 miles. It orbits Saturn at 759,220 miles in 16 Earth days. It is the only moon in the solar system with a substantial atmosphere at a surface atmospheric pressure of 1.45 times that of the Earth's. This atmosphere is mostly nitrogen with a little methane mixed in. This methane is a problem for evolutionary models since the sun would break it down in about 10 million years, which is far short of the four and a half billion years Titan is supposed to have been there. If Titan really were four and a half billion years old, first it would have a source of methane to replenish its atmosphere. Second, it would have a lot of ethane on its surface from all the broken down methane. Evolutionary predictions were that Titan's surface would have a global ocean of ethane over a kilometer deep. With the lander Huygen, this prediction was shown to be wrong. Titan's surface is dry with rocks of water ice. Now, Huygen did find lakes of methane and ethane, but not the global ocean. And they are not enough to fulfill the predictions of evolutionary models. Also, even if the lakes are pure methane, they add up to only 10% of what is in the atmosphere and would not last more than 10 million years. Yet another problem for evolutionary models is the lack of impact craters on Titan. According to evolutionary models, Titan should have thousands of craters, even allowing for those that burn up in its thick atmosphere. With 22% of Titan's surface surveyed, only five impact craters have been found. The fact is, the Titan surface looks quite young. It stands as an excellent example of the failure of evolutionary models in their alleged history. At first glance, Janus and Epimethus don't look impressive. They are, after all, small moons. It is, however, not their physical structure that is impressive, but their relationship. The orbits are separated by only 50 kilometers, and as a result, they switch orbits every four years in a delicate dance. They have come to be called the dancing moons. It is so balanced that every four years, the inner one becomes the outer one, and the outer one becomes the inner one. This arrangement is so stable and improbable that it suggests design. Uranus has over 25 moons, 
all went to orbit its equator despite the fact that the planet is tilted more than 90 degrees. It also has five moons that are massive enough to be round. Miranda is the smallest of Uranus' five round moons with a radius of 292 miles. It is also the innermost of Uranus's five round moons with an orbit of 80,659 miles in an orbital period of 34 hours. Miranda is also the strangest moon of the solar system. Miranda has a lot of different terrain, looking something like a patchwork quilt. Some of it looks like it has been strip mined. That's not saying that it has been, but that was a first impression description. It is a real hard one for evolutionary models. There are areas of rugged groove terrain next to smooth terrain and heavily cratered terrain. The rugged groove terrain looks a lot like it was painted on the moon with a brush. It is quite an unusual little moon. Here is a cliff six miles high. With Miranda's surface gravitational acceleration of 0.295 feet per second squared, if you jumped, it would take you 5 minutes and 50 seconds to reach the bottom. You would then slam into the ground at 62 miles an hour. It has been proposed that Miranda was brought into its current state by not one, but five asteroid collisions. But even other revolutionists agree that such a model would have totally destroyed the moon. So Miranda does not fit evolutionary models. The simple fact is that the solar system does not match the predictions of evolutionary models. They have done a horrible job of predicting what we will find in space. However, evolutionists always have some excuse as to why evolutionary models do not fit reality. And whenever possible, they alter the theory to make the field prediction go away. Creation models, on the other hand, have a rather good track record of predicting what the solar system is really like. When looked at objectively, the best explanation for the solar system is that it was created by God just a few thousand years ago.